From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. Today, I'm with my guest, Matthew Turner. Matthew is an author who's written several books, and his latest book is a fable called Beyond the Pale, a book that inspires you to question the success means to you and gives you permission to escape the hustle forever. So sit back, relax, grab a drink, and enjoy the engaging conversation that Matthew and I had. Morning, everybody. Uh, Rob Cairns here. I'm here with Matthew Turner, an author, and we're going to sit here and talk about his latest book. How are you this morning, Matthew? I am good, thank you, Robert. How are yourself? Uh, not too bad for a sunny, hot summer day in, in Canada, and uh, we're just talking. The UK is a little hot as well, I gather. Or? It's not as bad today. We did have a heat wave last week and it just cooled down. So Friday, Saturday, but yeah, this time last week, it was melting. Still yes. nice, still lovely, uh, a bit hazier though. So not quite as hot. So yeah, not not melting away anymore, but it's still, um, yeah, rather nice for, for this time of year. Yeah, it's, it seems to be the state all over the place. It's kind of a messed up year. So let's jump right in. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Sure. Well, as you say, my name is Matthew and I am an author. I'm based here in the north of England, Yorkshire. And I've spent my entire life in this beautiful part of the country where there's lots of greenery and rolling hillsides. And in my early 20s, I dipped my toe into the world of writing more as a form of therapy than anything else. It began with journaling and just getting ideas from thought to paper to better understand what was going on inside me. And it led to an idea of a story, which eventually became my first book, Beyond Parallel. And it was a book I wrote throughout my 20s, just as a bit of a side hobby, as I was getting my qualifications in the world of marketing, going to uni and everything. And I got to a point in my late 20s where I thought, I need to either finish this book and work with an editor and try and get it published, or I need to put it in a drawer and just forget about it forever. So I decided to commit, I decided to finish it, and it sparked the journey that I've been on for pushing on the last decade now. One book became two, became three, and here we are recording this on the cusp of my fifth book, Beyond the Pale, which is a fable, so it kind of brings the world of fiction and non-fiction together as one. And I'm very proud of it. And as well as writing my own books, I've also found a bit of a niche where I ghost write for clients, whether it's a book or articles. And that's been a journey in of itself. I uh, sort of started working for myself more, focusing on marketing, but I leaned further and further into my writing and realized there were other people who could get value from my writing. So it's crazy to think how that therapeutic journaling exercise pushing on, well, 16, 17 years ago now, has ever so surely become my career, my vocation, my a huge part of my life, whether it's writing for myself or for another. Yeah, it's funny, you, you talk about, uh... A couple of things in that you talk about journaling and it, and it's that's an exercise i think most people should do honestly um yeah i'm i'm an avid journal i i'm looking in front of me on my desk and there's a journal in front of me i tend to write you know for myself probably 10 or 15 minutes a day it helps organize your thoughts and organizes your head and it's amazing what comes from that in your case a love of writing. So that's that's really interesting. And the other thing you mentioned that uh, I find really interesting is you say you started one book and then you did two and then you did three. I have a couple of journalists or writers, writers in my local circles. And these are guys who 
wrote for uh, newspapers as a career and then retired and got into book writing. And it seems with writers, the writing never seems to stop. And that's just <laughs> a, something I've noticed. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or? <laughs> it's one of those things, yeah. I mean, the thing is with writing, and I think this is true probably of all art, all expression, it comes from inside you. Mm -hmm. It comes from, you know, thoughts, ideas, fears, worries, just those inner yeah. questions, that inner voice refusing to shut up. And I suppose one thing that separates writers from other forms of arts is that to write is to literally get thoughts from your head in, in long form onto paper and they become stories, they become anecdotes, they become like written forms of stories and tales. So it's not mm -hmm. just a picture, for instance, or it's not a song that lasts for three minutes. They often develop into very roundabout stories that hopefully have a point and several points that come together to help the reader in some form or another. So, and the common thing, whether you're a journalist, work in fiction, nonfiction, poet, whatever it may be is, your brain never switches off. And I think that's obviously true of all people. But as a writer, the only way you can usually make sense of those thoughts roaming inside your head, those inner monologues and dialogues, mm -hmm. the only way you can get any of them to make any sort of sense is to just literally get it out from your head onto the page. So yeah. you can read it, reread it, rewrite it, edit it go through that process again and again. And at least for me, I find that the only way I can truly get a thought from my head and, and turn it into something cohesive, something that I can better understand, something that I can articulate with others is to get it onto the page and then to read it, reread it, rewrite it, edit it, and so on. And I think at least from my experience with other writers, we all kind of follow that kind of pattern, whether we're journalists, poets, whatever it may be. And because your brain never switches off, because you never stop having these questions, because you ne never stop having these little musings, it just inevitably leads to one book, to another, to this, that. I, I don't think a, a writer can ever truly retire. They can slow down and they can take their time, but to just remove yourself from the process completely, I don't know if that's even possible. No, it's true. And and what I would appreciate, and I do appreciate, and I'll tell you, is I'm an avid reader. So when I read, and it doesn't matter if it's a fiction book, if it's a nonfiction book, um, if the writer has really done a good job, I can actually picture what the writer is saying in my head. Yeah. And I've always preferred, honestly, a good book over a movie or a TV mm. show, because I think there's details in a book that you cannot put in a movie or a TV show. There's background, there's information, there's a, depicting a picture and, and not throwing it at, I kind of call movies and TV shows the idiot box way of looking <laughs> at things. They, they present it for you and they expect you to see it their way. When you read a book that's well written, you see it your way. And it's really interesting. It's an interesting point. I mean, there's a couple of things here. So the first is that I, I, I think we forget and we underappreciate the role storytelling plays yeah. in our learning. Uh, I mean, even books, as they've been around for a long time now, in, in our opinion, but in terms of human history, there are recent invention mm -hmm. for literally millennia tens of millennia we passed information down through stories in person from the wise elders sharing stories to the younger folk so they could do the same later in life it's how we passed on important lessons it's how we passed on beliefs it's how we created beliefs and how we created commonality which led into civilization and society. So storytelling has played a humongous role in our evolution. It's almost a part of our DNA. And I think we forget that. 
because now we can learn in so many different ways. We have access to it in our phones and laptops all the time. And, you know, even sort of generations before us, they had access to it through books. But storytelling is just so deeply rooted inside us. And we have like an, a, an affiliation toward it. We trust stories in a way that I don't think we trust other forms of communication. So we naturally just lean in, take an interest and find a way to relate, which brings us to the other point, this idea of imagination. We're all born with incredible imaginations. The evidence is there whenever you look at a child, three years old, five years old, seven years old, 10 years old, whatever it may be, they're able to just create out of nothing. They're able to entertain themselves with, with toys and with a stick and just using their imagination. We all have that. And we just lose sight of that over time as we learn and we you know, educate ourselves and learn in different ways and we gain responsibility. But there's this inner child amongst us all. There's this imagination just screaming to get out. And I think what happens when we read, it taps into those two things, that kind of innate trust and affiliation to stories that are as a part of us as, you know, anything is. Like they are just like a part of us, a part of our DNA, a part of our beliefs, a part of our spirit, part of our soul. But it also taps into our imagination. It's not something that we can see. It's something that forces us to imagine. It forces us to picture and to relate and step into the shoes. We're not shown what the character in the book looks like. We have to read between the lines. And yeah, the, pe the person I picture in my head will differ to yours. They may be very similar, but there's something special about that. So I think reading and storytelling, it just connects us with those two things. It connects us with our imagination and that inbuilt affiliation toward story. So it's so true. You, as you were talking about storytelling, you were bringing me back to a little bit when I was a young boy. And I used to sit with my grandfather at the table, who's unfortunately long, long gone. And um, my grandfather was from Edinburgh, Scotland, originally. And he actually came over to Canada in those days. He came over on a boat. He didn't come yeah. over on a on a plane because of cost and bringing a trunk. And he came to Canada with his sister when he was 18. And one of the things he used to sit, and I've been to Edinburgh, he used to sit and talk to me before I went about Edinburgh and I could just picture stuff. And I think this is an art, and I really think it's a bit of an art that is a little bit lost with the, should I say the younger generation, um, they don't seem to have the same volition of imagination that you and I did. And they don't seem to have the same um, impact with storytelling. And they don't seem, certainly do not see the same impact of history with the society we're in, in the, um, in the, what I call the cancel uh, society. Um, I don't think they're in the same place. And I think it's it's making the world a harder place. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, well, I think it's a tricky one. I mean, obviously, it's hard to deny the fact that the world is very different today than yeah. it was when I was a kid and versus to when you were a kid and, and so on and so on. I think it's different. It's not necessarily... It's not necessarily missing. It's just different. Like I have a son. He's eight old. His imagination is is wild. It's vivid. It's it's immense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in awe of it. And he's able to still imagine, but he probably does it in a different way than I do. He's very much right now into things like Minecraft and starting to get into computer games. But he loves world building. Yeah, he he loves imagining in that sense. So his imagination is still very wild. And it's out there. He still has a strong affiliation to storytelling, but the way he expresses it and the way he connects to it is is different. It's less through reading. It's more through, you know, 
the computer game and seeing other people create those stories um, and sharing them on, on YouTube. So it's different. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would be, I, I think that's one of the problem we've always had as a society. And it leads us to ultimately say, oh, my generation's the best, you know? The today's generation, they don't do it the same. They don't do it the best. It, it is just different, you know. It's yeah. just different, and yeah, I don't think it would be fair or right to say how I went about it when I was a kid is better or worse than how it charged us. It's different. Yeah, I think one thing we need to be very strong about going forward as parents and as grandparents and as teachers and as leaders in the future is to just constantly try and think, okay. How can we nurture this imagination? If we're going to do it in a different way, how can we continue to nurture imagination? How can we nurture storytelling? We need to let it evolve. It's not always going to be in book form. It can take other forms too. And again, it's not to say it's better or worse, but we need to constantly be thinking about how we can nurture it and bring the best out of it and allow it to, to thrive. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um... The it's funny, I I once heard a well known billionaire, and I forget who said it. So, you know, say if you read an hour a day instead of watching TV an hour a day, your life would be better off and or more richer. And I've I've kind of subscribed to that theory. I'm I'm basically yeah. still a book a week person. So even at my age of 53, I read one book a week every week. Um, the big difference where it's changed is, for me, that book is often a Kindle book instead of a physical book. And, yeah, exactly. And we, we talk about changes, and uh, and part of that being is I'm a more I'm a very mobile person, so you know the kin the uh, e reader goes in the uh, bag with me, and it's easier, honestly, to carry five books on an e reader than five books in the bag. I mean, yeah. you know, so it I think does. It's I think it's a great, yeah, a great example of it. You know, reading is important for everything that we discussed. It just creates that yeah. connection between storytelling and your imagination. And you're always going to get something out of reading that you wouldn't from watching or yeah. from consuming a computer game, for instance. But reading can take on many forms. And I think especially now we're part of a, a generation in a society that finds it hard to focus on things for long periods of time, whether that's right or wrong. We're, we're certainly entering an age of micro consumption. So I think we'll see more and more serialization of stories where mm -hmm. they're shared like a chapter at a time and they're shared in like micro doses. So people are still getting their reading fix, but they're doing it in a way that connects with their lifestyle it connects with their form of reading their, their form of learning shall i say and i think society as a whole is going to continue to evolve and adapt in that sense from education to entertainment through the arts and everything it's just it's different like i don't fully understand it you know nowadays like <laughs> in a couple of years time it's already starting to an extent he's eight um will be nine this time george but in another couple of years, when he's 10 or 11, I just know that he's going to be all consumed by the TikTok world, you know, yeah. where it's just these little micro videos. I don't personally get it. <laughs> you know? I don't either. And I'm a marketer. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't particularly get it, but I have an appreciation, but I don't need to get it for it to be relevant, yeah. you know? And it's just the way the world's turning towards. And who knows what the world will look like in five years, 10 years, 50 years. It might become more of these micro consumptions. It might f flip on its head and become something where it just gravitates away from that because it becomes a fad and it becomes all about deep learning. And in which case, like big, big volumes of work will become the thing. You just never know. But right now, it certainly seems like, you know, people are, are, are finding it easier to learn in these small, short and sweet ways, whether it's visual, whether it's reading, whether it's audio. And I certainly see there's a there's a scope there for books and for authors and writers and readers to, to kind of get their fix in these shorter micro doses.
No, I, I would agree with that. Um, before we jump into your latest book, uh, did you decide to self-publish your books or have you gone through a publisher and why and where and if you could dive into that a little bit? So Beyond the Pale is my first traditionally published book. Mm -hmm. My previous four were self-published and I did so, you know, largely for the freedom and, and the creative license to be able to do what I want. But there was also, I think, a fear of rejection there and scared of like yeah. not getting past the gatekeepers. Okay. With Beyond the Pale, I felt like it was the book for me to, you know, step outside of my comfort zone. It's very much a book about stepping outside of your comfort zone. So to go the traditional route was a way for me to step beyond my own pale and do something I've not done, do something I've wanted to do but have feared doing. And it's been an eye-opening experience so far. It's been wonderful working with the publisher. It's been different. It's been good different in some ways. It's been not so good different in others. But I, yeah, I, I don't know what the future, I, I feel in the future I will continue to publish books in in a traditional sense, in a hybrid sense, and probably also in a self-published sense. It's one of the great things of today where there isn't a right or wrong way per se. It really mm -hmm. depends on the medium, it depends on the book, it depends on the goals of the book and who you're serving. And yeah, so this one is my first traditional book. I've done the self-published book and I think I'll do more of both moving forward. No, yeah, good. So let's dive into Beyond the Pale. On your website, there's a really good quote I, I like, and I'm just going to read it and get you to comment on. And you introduce it by saying, a book that inspires you to question the success means you and gives you permission to escape the hustle. And in brackets, you had the word forever. I really like that quote. It, I think it says a lot, and I think it's pretty inspirational. Um, do you want to kind of talk about the quote a little bit, please? Yeah. It's, in a nutshell, a huge part of the book's premise. So it's not, it's like I say, it's, it's a blend of fiction and nonfiction. So when you read a novel, quite often it's designed to help you escape and to entertain. It doesn't mm -hmm. usually do a particularly good job of educating or enlightening. It's not to say that the book won't have hidden meanings and you will learn from it. But it's first and foremost, like most novels, especially, you know, the kind of easier to consume novel, whether it's like thriller or crime or fantasy, they're there to help you escape from your life a little bit, just disconnect and to entertain. A nonfiction book, on the other hand, is, is completely different. It really is there to help you learn. So it's there to educate and or enlightening. It doesn't usually do a great job of entertaining or allowing you to you know, escape your life to disconnect. So a fable is like a blending of the two where it's designed to entertain and help you escape, but also at the same time, educate and enlighten you. And the educating and the enlightenment aspect of Beyond the Pale is to, in a very sort of informal way, just help you question your role in the hustle. It's to help you question what success means to you. I think we all have this bland association of success. Most of us, maybe even all of us, at least for a good chunk of our lives, because we're following what our parents taught us, we're influenced by the media and what we learn at school. So we believe that success is getting a degree, having a job, climbing the ladder, a certain house, a certain right, you know, there's certain rules that we follow. And we're like, okay, if I follow these rules, I will lead a successful life. It will allow me to pursue happiness. But we don't have any real passion to what that. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have any real meaning to us. And when we take a step back and think, what does success mean to me? Like get real specific. Most of the struggle, and well, I, I'm not too sure. I have an idea of what it is but I've never taken the time to strip the layers away like an onion and get to the root and be like, okay, this is success, this is meaning, this is happiness for me, this is my purpose. And Beyond the Pale is all about that, stripping away those layers and helping you kind of connect with that purpose, that version, that true definition of success. 
And I think one of the things that gets in the way of that for all of us is this idea of the hustle. Not necessarily the grinding till the early hours every day, not necessarily working 70 hour work. That's a version of the hustle. It's a very toxic version too. But really what hustle means, it's, it's, it's around this ever connected notion of life. We are constantly connected to other people, constantly comparing ourselves to other people. And I think this was always happening. It's just more rife these days due to social media and the fact that we're connected by our phones and, and our computers because we're able to just constantly check in on our email. We're constantly able to just do a little bit of work. We're constantly able to just scroll through social media for a little bit and compare our lives with other people's lives. We're not getting a real insight into their life, of course. We're just getting an edited version of the successful version of them. And it leads us to compare and like, oh, well, they look happier than me. They seem to be more successful than me. They may need to, so I need to do more of what they're doing. I need to work a little bit harder. I need to work a little bit longer. I need to do a little bit more. So you keep yourself busy. You keep yourself distracted by just doing more, 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 doing, 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 which stops you from taking a step back and reflecting and thinking, all right, well, what does success for me to me? What is my vision? What is my mission? What is the important work that I need to be doing? So you don't give yourself any time to do the things you need to do. And instead, you just distract yourself with all this stuff, which stops you from achieving what you can. So it's a vicious cycle. And once you step back and start to question what success means to you, it helps you step away from the hustle. And the more you distance yourself from the hustle, the more you can go deeper into the real definition of success, purpose, meaning, happiness, and such. So it's so, it's so true. I mean, how many people actually take a look at success and then look at themselves and say, am I happy with me? And exactly. they don't realize if you're not happy with you, it doesn't matter what perceived success you have. You really don't have it. And then the other comment I have really quickly out of that uh, discussion we're having is we talk about social media and what people post and we try and meet them. What most people have to realize is the average person on social media only posts their best things or yep. their worst things. They don't post anything in between. So yeah. they're either posting, they get attention, or they're posting their best things. Oh, look at me. I look great today. Look at me. I had a birthday party with my friends today. You know yeah. what? That's not reality. The reality is I had a great birthday party, but then I had to go home and do family time. I had to do chores. I had to deal with a call from a friend who wasn't feeling good. I wasn't feeling good. You, you, you get what I'm saying. They don't look mm -hmm. at all this stuff. And, and I think part of the problem with all of this is everybody keeps doing the hustle. And I've done it in my career. I had a job in healthcare in IT where I was working 70 hours a week. And I left that job 11 years ago and said, geez, I'm so much more happier. Mm -hmm. And it's because you get caught in just doing it because everybody else does it. But that doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean you're successful and it doesn't make you any more happier. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, if the fact is life is pretty boring. It's pretty mm -hmm. vanilla. It's pretty beige. Like it doesn't matter who you are, how adventurous you are. Most of the hours in the day are spent sleeping, getting ready, doing you know the essential tasks you need to do chores around a house commuting things like this even if you're an adventurous go-getter who lives life to the fullest more of your life is still spent doing just everyday bland things and there's nothing wrong with that that is just a part of life but like you say we get all these insights into all these people just we see their really amazing moments we see their really you know the highlight reel and we're like oh man my, my day's been so boring and they've been living their life to the fullest. They look so much fun. Like, oh, I wish I was like them. I don't see all their bland life. You know, we don't realize that they're also comparing themselves to someone else. And 
yeah, it's it can get real toxic and it gets you into that vicious cycle where hustle just distracts you, leads you deeper into the hustle and onto that hamster wheel and you give yourself no time. Whereas if you can just start distancing yourself away from it, and I think if the key catalyst is to give yourself some time to reflect on what success means to you, it helps you, it gives you permission to step away from the hustle. And the more you step away from the hustle, the more you can dive deeper into the real version of success, which allows you and gives you permission to step further away from the hustle, which leads you more into your success and more away from the hustle and such and such. So it's it's one of those things where being stuck in a hustle is a vicious hamster wheel, you know, where one fuels the other. But if you can step away from it, it's the opposite. Like good can fuel good, can fuel good, can fuel good. So, I mean, in a nutshell, that's kind of the premise of Beyond the Pale and what I hope the reader takes from it. And they're like, okay, well, what is my role in hustle? Like, what is actually the purpose of my work, my life, my my being? Like, who do I want to be? What do I want to, uh, you know, be, you know, when I get to the end of my days, what do I want to have achieved? What what do I want to have represented? Like, what does going a mile deep mean to me? And the more people who can commit themselves to that, I feel we will have a much more purpose-driven world. Yeah, it's true. Um, in On your website, you make another really good point, and you say this is for people who wish to align their mind, their body, and their soul. Um, I would really agree with that um, in, in talking in this discussion. You have to have the three aligned. I think mm-hmm. it matters. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so I often work like a lot of the stuff which comes away from the book when I work with people in person. I talk about you have to be selfish in order to be selfless. And I think, again, this is one of the things that can only happen when you step away from the hustle. When you're in the hustle, you get so caught up in like serving others, like being, you know, your best self all the time. But you don't actually really give yourself any time to truly fill your own cup. You can be like really you know like an amazing body you know but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're filling your own cup you're just burning yourself out once you start stepping away from the hustle it gives you time it gives you again this word permission to start truly serving you like being a little bit selfish selfless selfish so you can be selfless Uh, cruel to be kind if you will and i honestly feel like the only way you can ever fill other people's cups whether it's your kids, your partners, your customers, your clients, whatever it may be, is if you first fill your cup. And when it comes to filling your cup, it's all about mind, body, spirit. Each and every day, you need to be giving yourself some time to fuel your mind, your body, your spirit. You know, doing a bit of exercise, fueling your body with the right kind of foods obviously plays an important role, but just getting out there and moving. That doesn't mean you need to be an Adonis. That just means you need to get out there and just move your body, go for Mm -hmm. a walk. Mm -hmm. When I talk about mind, it doesn't mean that you need to be someone who's reading eight books a week or Mm -hmm. learning all these different courses or being super smart. This just means giving yourself some time to escape your work, escape your life, to just read up on whether it's fiction or philosophy or history or psychology or whatever else but learning for the sake of you know like fueling something within you not just learn for the sake of learning but learning to you know expand yourself and obviously it doesn't necessarily always be learning journaling can be a form of fueling your mind and then when it comes to spirit and soul i mean for some people it's religious some you know it turns on prayer it uh, like to fuel your spirit it could be volunteering but it also could just be meditating for a little while. It could be doing a little bit of yoga, which combines spirit and body. It could be a form of journaling. It could be going for a walk and just reflecting on your life. So again, what body means to you, or shall I say what fueling your body means to you, what fueling your mind means to you, what fueling your spirit or your soul means to you, totally different. And there's no right or wrong. There's loads of things you could do. And in time, the idea is that you hone in on what works for you. But then just giving yourself that time every day to fill your cup. Because if you wake up every day and give yourself time to fill your cup, you will find it so much easier to fill other people's cups. If you serve you, you will find it so much easier to serve others. And it won't be an obligation. 
It'll be something you lean into because you have the energy to do so. You have the motivation to do so. But again, so hard to do if you're caught up in a hustle. But once you take a step back from it, it becomes so much more attainable. It is so it is so true, Matthew. Like I I look at you say serve yourself and you say to the average person, why didn't you take care of yourself? You know what the response is? I don't have time. Yeah. And and I always look at people and, and my mom love her dearly. She's 74, she's great. And I say, Well, why don't you do this? I don't have time. And I, what I say to her is, You mean it's not a priority? Exactly. Yes. Because yeah. the one thing I've learned and I've in my journey, I've been through a couple, uh, you know, bad long-term relationships. I've been through, you know, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a separation that's leading to a divorce. I mean, that's just part of life. And, and one of the things I've learned is you got to take care of yourself first. And if you can't take care of yourself, you can't serve others. You can't help others. You can't be there and you can't be happy. And when it comes to, you know, people say, but you're selfish. And I said, oh, good. No problem there. I'm good with that because you're allowed to be selfish about your own happiness. You have to be because at the end of the day, nobody else is going to make you happy. And you got to start to make the important things. And you talk about things like going for a walk. That's something I do every day. I go for an hour walk and it's probably where I do my most heavy thinking. Yeah, and I, seriously. And, I, yeah. and I actually started going for a walk to clear my head like years ago. And the, and the reason I kept walking is I've actually managed to keep weight under control as you get older becomes a problem. And that's helped keep weight under control. So it served two purposes. And yeah. I find, honestly, I'm the most heavy thinking when I'm walking. I'm also the most emotional with myself when I'm doing that heavy thinking and I'm walking. Yeah. And you tap, and when, you tap into yourself. And when I say emotional, I, I've, over the last couple of years, I don't always let my emotions go around other people because, frankly, at the end of the day, they don't care. And that's just the reality, people. And so I deal with them myself, and it's when I'm out walking. And, and you don't have to do all the things you talk about. And I, I keep coming back to three I do regularly as I walk. I journal. And the other thing I do every night before I go to bed is I meditate for 20 minutes. And that actually helps me sleep and helps me unwind and helps me transition. It's not for everybody. I tried it five years ago. And I said, are you kidding me? And then I found a spot with it where it, it really works. So but the point is, do something that works for you and try and work that out. And and the other word we talk about being selfish that people have to learn is the word no. <laughs> oh, yes. And that's that's a really powerful word. And, and when you say no, don't validate it. Why not? Because I said no. Don't validate it. Because the minute you validate it, you give an opening. So I'm, I'm a big fan of saying no. And people say, why did you say no? Because I don't want to. Very simple. No. Nope. Because if I say maybe, that leaves the door open, right? So mm. it's interesting. Yeah, it is a very powerful word. And in the whole world of selfish, the only real way you can be selfish is if you just become one who only ever takes. So if you keep taking time for yourself, and then refuse to serve others with it, then in time you become selfish. Yes, but if you are the... being selfish and filling your cup so you can turn up for those who need you, whether that's turn up as a mother or a father, a friend, a partner, sibling, mm. a leader at work as you lead a team, or just a colleague, or a peer, or a mentor, or by serving your clients, your customers, your audience. If you're being selfish, so then you can serve others. That isn't really being selfish. It only becomes selfish is if you just keep taking and taking and taking. You become like a narcissist. Yeah. That's the only real way to become selfish. As long as you're taking time, as long as you're saying no, so it has meaning, so that you can then serve other people, so that you can be generous in some way or another, then it's, it's I'll say, it's being cruel to be kind. 
It's being selfish so you can be selfless. It's filling your own cup so then you can fill other people's. It's putting your own oxygen mask on yep. so that you have the capability of then putting on your son or daughters. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. And I would also go so far as to say it's even the people who hit the weekend and say, I need a quiet down day. Well, you're you're doing that so you can recharge yeah. and, and do other things. And, you know, we, we all need downtime. I hate to say it, especially in the last year and a half. This The world's been tougher than it's ever been before in our generation, I think. So. And, and one thing I always add to it as well, for those listening, is give yourself permission to, to do that, right? Yep. Like you say, give yourself permission to say no. Give yourself to be yourself permission to be selfish. And also allow other people to do the same. Mm -hmm. When someone says no to you and your first instinct is to be offended and to be defensive, that's fine if that's your initial thought or feeling. You have them. But then remind yourself they're allowed to say no. If your partner says, I want time. It's okay if your initial reaction is to feel frustrated, but then remind yourself that is okay. They too deserve to fill their own cup. Of course. You know, of course, if they keep taking and taking and taking, then that's a different conversation to have. But be the person who is okay with having those around you to say no to you. Say, I need some room. I need some space. I want some time. I think it's important yeah. to be both selfish and allow other people to be selfish yeah i would i would agree i just want to sort of throw an observation at you you know you talk about this book being a fable i almost think and maybe i'm wrong this book needs to be in the self-help section of the bookstore <laughs> if you if you can understand where i'm going from it kind of falls into a lot of the the mind and body type books or or that philosophy books do you have any thoughts on yeah it's i mean it's main it's main category on the back of the book actually uh, i think it has it on here somewhere yeah it's body mind spirit and then yep. slash inspiration and personal growth they're like the main um, categories if you will when um like books have different categories like bookstores have different categories yep. and they're like the main ones and honestly, I think all fables, to some degree, um, should probably slip under the, the self-help section. Uh, I mean, self-help can take on so many different forms. And a fable is like a version of self-help that like massages an idea into your brain rather than kind of forces it in, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like a how-to self-help of like follow these seven strategies or these seven steps and you will X, Y, and Z. It's more just a subtle nudge helping you relate in some form or another. But done right, every fable, every parable, every allegory, they're a form of self-help. And oftentimes they have the exact form of self-help that most of us need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about inspiration and we talk about self-help. Do you have any inspiration of other people in that field that you've kind of turned to for direction, advice, personal growth? I mean, there's been many over the years as I've gone down the, you know, the personal development mindset and rabbit hole. There's lots of people I've learned on over the years. I've um, I've certainly taken more of a personal inspiration those who are more philosophical. So I'm I'm a big fan of Ryan Holiday, for instance, right. who covers a lot of you know areas of like within like you know personal development around sort of ego and growth and things. But he comes at it from a very sort of philosophical and stoic sense, and I like that because philosophy, as a general rule, doesn't have rules. I mean, the whole point of philosophy is to try and figure out life, but also appreciate that life isn't there to be figured out. It just is there to get you to question and to reflect and to think about these big things. And it's not always about having an answer. It's just having the care and the commitment to go in search of the questions. So Ryan Holiday is certainly someone who's inspired me a lot and other people as well. Camel Ravikant, who's someone who I'm... Um, very proud to say he's part of a book, and I interviewed him to be in part of the book, and his character features in it. 
he's someone whose writing has inspired me a lot of recent years. And I'm also a big fan of Vishen Lakhani. I feel like he has introduced me to some very incredible people who, again, look at sort of personal development in a, you know, a unique way, in their own yeah. sort of little ways. He tends to, you know, gravitate towards people who, you know, don't necessarily conform into the, into the typical way, you know, they're quite atypical in things. And and him himself is is a fantastic writer and educator. So yeah, three those three names certainly come to mind. Oh, thank you for sharing that. So if you know you were to project your ideal reader for this book, who would it be? They so I, when I originally wrote it, I thought it would be something that would appeal largely and maybe exclusively to business owners, you know, kind of entrepreneurs, um, people who run their own business in a, in a largely online way. So obviously that takes on many forms these days. You could be a business owner or you could be like a, a solopreneur or a freelancer or a contractor. But the more I dove down its rabbit hole and given out the advanced copies and, you know, reflected and observed, I've realized it's pretty applicable to anyone who is just rather consumed by the online world. That obviously covers a lot of entrepreneurs and influencers and, and things of that. But that also covers a lot of people who have, you know, your more sort of standard nine to five jobs because so many people's work now centers around social media, emails, Zoom meetings, things of that nature. And people just in their spare time, they so often will just turn to the online world to learn from Googling and articles and just consuming podcasts, YouTube channels, books, articles, blogs, just for the sake of it, as a form of procrastination, getting caught in a hustle. Social media, so that they can compare themselves to others, as everything that we talked about earlier. So the book is just very much for today's online-centered world. If you feel like you're someone who probably spends too much time either working or distracting yourself online, it's a book that will probably speak to you in some way. Specifically, if you are someone who has built your persona of success online, whether that's a nine to five job, whether that's working for yourself, whether that's building an online business, it will certainly speak to you because it's all about this idea of stepping away from the supposed person you think you need to be and tapping and going in search of the person you need to be. Yeah, that that's so really key. Um, when's the book available, Matthew? You say it's not quite ready yet. How soon is the published date? Where are you at in the process? It is its official birthday is the 24th of August. So that's when it becomes available in bookstores, it's shipping from Amazon and all that good stuff. But it is available as of now on beyondbook.co. It has links there so you can download the ebook and pre order the book so it ships as soon as it's available. There's also a free sample on beyondbook.co where you can read the first few chapters to see whether it's something you would enjoy so yeah it's it's available for anyone who likes like yourself to to read on a kindle it's available now but if you like to thumb through a book and have it held in person and its official release is 24th of august okay and is it can be available on amazon just in the uk or have you set it up for distribution like in the us etc yeah us most i mean in terms of like amazon Barnes and noble all the online bookstores pretty much global reach um in come august and it's uh, going to be available in hopefully many american and canadian bookstores from the 24th of august and then i think it'll be available in sort of a lot of uk and then global bookstores around about sort of 9th of september I have to tell you, Matthew, I love to read, and I cannot remember the last time I stepped in a bookstore. <laughs> Isn't that, you know, it just, we used to have um, this monstrous bookstore in Toronto called World's Biggest Bookstore. And it used really? to go like, like a full block, it was. And it was bought out by one of the big Canadian bookstore chains, and 
needless to say, it's no longer there. It's actually been demolished. It's now a condo building. Yuck. But no. I, um, I just find, and it's just been my personal choice when I order books. I order. I tend to order them on Amazon. And the reason the reason I do is, you walk into the small bookstore in a mall, and they usually don't have everything. And then they say, "Do you?" Can I order that for you? Well, I can order that myself. I don't need you guys to order for me. <laughs> like, so I, I, I kind of, I kind of miss that a little bit. Uh, where I used to get lost, I'd walk into a bookstore and I peruse books for hours. But you know, times have yeah. changed. Times have changed. For convenience, I often will, yeah, Amazon. But I also enjoy a good trip to a bookstore. Yeah, it gets, quite, get, pr gets pr quite pricey though. I find. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Um, if somebody can get a hold of you, how is the best way to talk about the book? Like I say, beyondbook.co. So that's beyondbook.co. Gives you all the information about the book. There's a book trailer on there, links to where you can buy slash pre-order it. And as I say, you can grab a free sample so you can read the first few chapters, see if it's something you'd like to read. And there's also links there to like my Facebook, the Facebook group, and instagram all that stuff so beyondbook.co will give you everything you need about me and the book thank you so much for joining me today matthew and really all the best with the book it, it looks like it's going to be a great read um download the f the first couple free chapters have a read they're really good and uh i think you're going to do really well with it and all the best thank you so much really appreciate it A very special thank you to Matthew Turner for joining me on this edition of the SDM Show. Make sure you check out his book, Beyond the Pale, when it's released. Thanks for listening to the SDM Show. The show is a production of Stunning Digital Marketing, and all rights are reserved. Rob can be reached by email at vip at stunningdigitalmarketing.com, on Twitter at Rob Cairns, on his website, stunningdigitalmarketing.com, and on his website, there's links to all his social media platforms. This show is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much. Keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Make your business succeed.